How's everybody doing? We're good? Uh, let's give it up for John Reinheimer one more time. All right, worship leader extraordinaire. Isn't that impressive? I mean, seriously, just so you know, the rest of our campus pastors, like, they can barely walk and chew gum at the same time. All right, so multiple talents with this guy. Um, I'm going to jump, jump right in here and uh, tell you, you know, I've been, I've been here at Community for 19 years now. Uh, my oldest daughter is 17 years old, so Community and, and my family have just gone together this whole way, and I love the age that my kids are in right now. My, my kids are in a great age. Um, our youngest daughter is in junior high. All right, so she's pretty independent, you know, making her own way. My oldest daughter, like I said, is 17. She's a junior in high school. And so I'm actually still in the season of denial where, like, college hasn't quite hit or moving away or leaving the nest. So it's just this sweet spot right now. And then my son is in the middle, and we just play video games all day. And so it's, like, the best. And, and, and it's with a certain level of accomplishment and glee that I now sort of stroll through the grocery stores around town. I watch toddler meltdowns, you know, in the uh, in the cereal aisle. Uh, I see them see them in the bakery, right? Uh, You know, you see them fighting two little ones fighting over that that race car grocery cart, you know, as though their lives hang in the balance of getting to operate that tiny toy wheel, right? We, We all know that of which I speak. Oh, it's so nice to be not a part of that anymore. Um, And when it comes to toddlers, and how they make decisions like that, uh, we all know that they are not operating under an admirable set of rules. No, and in fact, recently, <laughs> yeah, recently I sat down with a group of toddlers to uh, better understand where they're coming from, and they actually shared with me a code of conduct that's known as the toddler rules of possession. I wasn't familiar with that before, but, but now I am, and, and here's what they told me. Number one, If I like it, it's mine. (laughs) Number two, if it's in my hand, it's mine. Number three, if I can take it from you, it's mine. Uh, Number four, if I had it a little while ago, it's mine. Uh, Number five, if it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. Uh, Number six, if I'm doing or building something, all the pieces are mine. Okay, good. Number seven, if it looks just like mine, it is mine. Uh, Number eight, if I saw it first, it's mine. Uh, Number nine, if you are playing with something and you put it down, it automatically becomes mine. Uh, And number 10, if it's broken, it's yours. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Yeah, we can laugh at the little ones, can't we? Uh, I wonder, though, if we as adults feel about our money and possessions. I mean, I mean, the way we feel, is it really all that much different? Mine! A local celebrity, Charles Stevens, in the house. Good work. And guys, I just really want to apologize about the whole remote control thing. I realize that's a very serious subject, and uh, we should not joke about that, and so we'll try to get it right next time. Um, we are in week three of our current series that's all about a two-year initiative that we're calling One. And uh, we want to make sure that everyone has one of these booklets. We've, we've been handing them out in our Sunday services. If you already have one, and we we're encouraging you to bring it to service. Uh, if you don't have one, though, and you need one, go ahead and raise your hand, and our ushers uh, will come by and just kind of make those available. Um, okay, so we've got, we've got a few here, and they're making their way right here. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, in, in here, in this booklet, are the details 
uh, that are outlined, these opportunities that we believe that God is giving us, Community Christian Church, to expand His kingdom. And really, we want every single one to be in on it. There's a couple in the front here who need some. Yep, they're coming around on the side. All right, beautiful. Um, and we, here's what we would do. We would love for you to bring this booklet back with you each Sunday for the remainder of this series. Uh, and, and it's also something that you can bring to your small group because we are also encouraging all of our small group leaders to go through the discussion questions that live in this booklet, all right? So that's something we want to make sure that you're aware of. Now, each week of, these, of this series is leading us towards what we're calling Commitment Sunday. That's on February 28th where we, all 12 of our locations, will join together as one, one church, one vision to accomplish the one mission together by making two-year generosity commitments. All right, And our primary goal for the one initiative, just so that we're clear, is to see everyone who calls Community Christian Church their church home, we want every single person to be a part of this. All right, and we've been reading from the book of Acts, and, and we really do want to experience what we believe the first century church experienced when they joined together. Uh, Luke tells us, and this is a translation from the message, uh, the message translation, it says, uh, the whole congregation of believers was united as one, one heart, one mind. They didn't even claim ownership of their own possessions. No one said, that's mine. You can't have it. They shared everything. Now, as I read that, I, I don't think it sounds anything like uh, a toddler's rules of possession. Uh, but, but we are in a world that drifts so easily towards attitudes of me and mine. But, but you see that community of Christ followers that really, uh, they embodied a spirit of we and ours. Uh, they're described as having one heart and mind. And that, that oneness results in very tangible expressions of generosity. But, I mean, let's be honest, it's, it's a little hard to imagine experiencing that kind of oneness, you know, at that, at that level. Okay? But I do believe, I believe God wants to mature us and to grow us during this process. I think he wants to transform us from me to we, from mine to ours. I believe God wants to make us a church that is united as one, one heart and one mind. So, as we continue on this journey, I want to look at the story of a guy in, in the Bible who transformed from a me perspective to a we perspective. In fact, some, some songs call him a we little man. Uh, but his name is Zacchaeus, all right? And his story is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. Luke tells us that Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Now, I'm just going to stop right there to point out something about Zacchaeus' name. His parents actually named him Zaka, which in Hebrew means pure or just or righteous one. And I imagine just like us, just like me with my kids or you with your families, I mean, we imagine big dreams, you know, big dreams for little Zaka. I mean, sure, he may have been like all the other toddlers, you know, throwing tantrums in the Jerusalem Target, uh, you know, wreaking havoc in the Judea Toys R Us, uh, but, but but when they named him Zaka, they envisioned him growing up to live up to that name, someone who was righteous, someone who cared about justice, someone who was pure in heart. And keep that in mind as I read on, because in the next breath, Luke tells us that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Okay, so here's how this went down in those times. The Roman Empire had conquered the area known as Palestine. It was an area that included the town of Jericho. Now, what the Romans did is they broke that area up into three different regions, and in each region, there would be someone there who would bid to become the chief tax collector. All right, now, so how did you become the chief tax collector? Well, it was really simple. You, you most likely bribed the Roman government for the right to have the job. And, and so when Luke tells us that Zacchaeus is the chief tax collector, I mean, that's a huge insight into who the toddler Zaka had become. And to compound matters, after the Roman government had assessed a region to figure out how much they should be getting in taxes, they would allow the chief tax collector to surcharge the people above and beyond that amount to make money for themselves. That's why he was wealthy. So I'm sure you're figuring this out by now, but in case you haven't, among the Jewish people, 
tax collectors were considered the worst of the worst because not only did they work for the occupying pagan Roman government, okay, but the way that they got wealthy was by cheating and threatening and blackmailing their own people into overpaying for their taxes. Who wants to overpay their taxes in an election year, right? Show of hands if you want to be friends with Zacchaeus, right? Nobody, nobody likes Zacchaeus, all right? Now, continuing on, Luke tells us that Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now, I think this is important to note. By by this time, I mean, Jesus had become a pretty popular public figure. I mean, and even though Zacchaeus is this kind of shady, hated greedy sort of guy. I mean, he's not immune to this curiosity about who Jesus was, this this unusual Jewish rabbi. I mean, he wants to get a good look at Jesus, so he climbs up a tree, right? And then Luke tells us, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now, think about this. You got hundreds of people in the crowd. Jesus turns his attention to a tree. One outcast is sitting there hanging out in the tree and he invites himself to dinner. Right? I mean, that, that's a little strange, right? To invite yourself to dinner? I mean, it's not, it's not really polite in our culture, right? I mean, I, I, like I could do, like I, if I did that, you know, right after service, I'm sure whoever's house I came to, you'd have a great time. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> you would really enjoy it if I invited myself to your dinner. The part, it's, it's not about enjoyment, it's just not polite. You would still say, okay, well, we had a great time, but Eric really shouldn't have done that. Um, because we don't really do that here. But in Jesus' culture, this was a huge compliment. What Jesus was saying about Zacchaeus, that he would invite him to come to his house, that was a huge deal. I mean, I mean, Jesus was, I mean, his popularity was soaring, and for him to invite him over was a, was a huge deal. I mean, it, it's kind of like, I mean, imagine, like, I don't know, I mean, Adele or somebody, you know, just like kind of calling you up and saying, you know, hey, can I come over to have a little pizza at your house, right? I mean, that's how she talks. That's the accent. I don't know if you can tell. I was doing a, like a, a thick British accent. Um, hmm. Yeah. And actually, for me, it's not Adele so much that I'm into. I mean, I think she's great, and I sing just like her. But for me, I mean, the, the person that I really, I mean, if Paul McCartney, right, gave me a call, right, and said, I, you know, and I'm not going to do his accent, but I mean, pretty much anyone in an English accent has my vote. I, wanna, I want them to come to my house. But I mean, seriously, if Paul, if Paul McCartney, like, got a hold of me and said, I want to come over and hang out at your house today after church, I mean... Wow, you know, I mean, I'm getting excited to think about it right now, you know, just like that, like adrenaline is going right now because that would just be awesome. I actually, I was, prepared, I was preparing for this talk and, and I, this is for real. Last night I had a crazy dream and, and I really did have this dream because I was preparing and I had written down this and I dreamed, I dreamt that Paul McCartney came to my house and the whole time I couldn't find the video footage of Let It Be Christmas. I was trying to like show him because we do this musical that's got the Beatles songs and like the whole time he's just like waiting patiently and I'm like trying, I'm like, I don't know where it is. I can't find it. So, I mean, so serious. The point is both in my conscious and my subconscious, I would be really geeked out if he came over for dinner. Um, That's my point. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Um, (laughs) But here In Zacchaeus' day, eating with somebody made a very clear cultural statement. It was an ex- it was a sign of acceptance. It was a sign of value. You were publicly declaring that you were happy to be associated with this person. And it's one of the things that Jesus gets criticized for constantly in the Bible. I mean, pe- people are often muttering behind his back, you know, what's wrong with this guy? I mean, he is hanging out with, with drunks and scoundrels and sinners. But our story continues, and Zacchaeus does take Jesus home. And they do have dinner. But there's an interesting gap in this part of the story. I mean, Luke doesn't tell us what they talked about. He doesn't tell us what happened as they ate together. I mean, we don't know if they ordered Chinese takeout or had homemade lasagna. 
Um, we don't know if Mrs. Zacchaeus was there or if it was just a guy's night. Um, we don't really know what happened that day in that house somewhere in Jericho. But we do know this. Zacchaeus' life was transformed. One meal, one day, one encounter with Jesus. And Jericho's chief tax collector sings a completely different tune. You see, in the very next verse, verse 8, Luke tells us, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. I mean, just take a moment to look at that, to see that change and what that activity reflects. Zacchaeus, the corrupt tax collector, the greediest guy in town, says, here and now, I give half my possessions to the poor. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. All his life, he has been the me first guy, right? Mine, trying to figure out how to get more and more. And now he's completely fired up about giving it all away. But he is for real. And we know he's for real because of what Jesus says next. In response of his declaration of generosity, Jesus says, today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. So you know what I think? <laughs> I think his parents were right. They gave him the name Zaka to grow into. And Zaka means pure, just, righteous one. But see, no one can become pure, just, or righteous on their own until they encounter Jesus and make him number one in their life. It's only when Jesus is number one in your life that your heart and mind gets transformed. And if we look closely, we'll see that there are three outward signs in Zacchaeus' life that, that help us understand that he has declared that God is number one. All right, now the first one, sign number one, it's obvious in the story, making God number one transformed his finances. Absolutely transformed. Instead of amassing wealth for himself, he gave half of his possessions away. Instead of cheating people, he gave and made restitution back, paying four times what he had taken. And instead of managing money for his own gain, he began using it to benefit others. And so I wonder, I mean, what would it look like in our finances for God to be number one in our life? Now, I know that nobody here is actually in the business of overtaxing and taking advantage of others. I mean, we might do it on the side, but it's not like our whole job, right? Um, but, I mean, we, you need to ask ourselves, like, are there ways I currently manage money that are not honoring to the one who gave it to me? Am I honoring God with my spending? Am I honoring God with my savings? Am I honoring God with my giving? And let's face it, I mean, when it comes to money, so many of us make the mistake of viewing it as mine. I mean, that's what Zacchaeus thought. But, but the truth is, I mean, it all belongs to God. It's just given to us to manage. And understand, God isn't asking us to give him 100%, but he is asking us to honor him with 100%. And that is an important distinction that we do need to wrap our minds around. See, Zacchaeus begins the meal thinking that it's all his, and by the time the meal is over, he recognizes that everything he has belongs to God, and immediately he makes plans to relocate, to reallocate rather, and honor God with it. So, making God number one transformed Zacchaeus' finances. And making God number one transformed his relationships too. I and mean, that's the second kind of outward sign. I mean, can you imagine the looks on the faces of people in his town when they open up their front door to find Zacchaeus standing there with one of those giant publisher's house clearing, you know, checks for like four times of what he's taken from them? I mean, can you imagine the expressions of gratitude from the people who benefited from his generosity? I mean, after encountering Jesus and making him number one in his life, Zacchaeus suddenly cared about, more about others than about his own wealth. He gave half his possessions to the poor. And, and it's fairly likely that he, he didn't know those people by name. And, and understand, I mean, generosity, generosity perhaps more than anything other, gets noticed. I mean, 
can't really hide generosity. I mean, if, if one day somebody's poor and the next day they're fed, I mean, people notice that stuff. They notice it. Uh, many people probably ask, you know, why, why is he doing this? What changed? What changed in his life? And of course, the only thing that any, anyone could point to was that encounter he had with Jesus. An encounter that is now changing his relationships and resulting in people wanting to know more about this Jesus. So, let me ask you, and I ask myself the same exact question. Has your encounter with Jesus and making him number one in your life, has it transformed your relationships? Do you find that you're more concerned for the well-being of others? I mean, if I ask the people closest to you or you ask the people closest to me, I mean, what would they say? When we encounter Jesus, when we make him number one, our finances are transformed and our relationships are transformed. And in this story, I mean, I have to believe that making God number one transformed his purpose too. You see, I'd love to know the course of Zacchaeus' life that, that, that happened, you know, after he met Jesus. We don't really get to hear that story in the Bible. I mean, there's no question in my mind, though, that, that his life took on a new focus, a new meaning. I mean, it's what happens when, when people encounter Jesus. And he gives us a new purpose for our lives, to be on mission with him and for him. You see, for many of us, like Zacchaeus, our story of transformation is directly tied to our generosity. And uh, I'd like to share one of those stories with you today. I'm Dave Kradowitz. This is my wife, Catherine, and we've been coming to community for about a year and a half now. We were a little scared to come to community since it had been so long since we had come to church. So I was always looking for something. Things just fell into place last summer. We walked in, we immediately saw Chris, and he was so welcoming, and we had no idea who any of these people were, and they were so nice. And we're like, ooh, what's wrong with everybody? <laughs> and I started to notice things like, oh, this person has sandals, and that person's wearing shorts, and there's a, a football jersey, and um, just very non-judgmental, just very welcoming. And that's really what kept us coming back. I would say I was just very lost for a long time, and it wasn't from not having support from my family or anything like that. I think I got mixed in with the wrong crowd of people and just made bad decision after bad decision. I think for me, using drugs and drinking all the time was more of a, a numbing, a coping mechanism. Numerous stints in rehab and this therapy and that therapy and just nothing ever helped and I was mad. I was mad at God. Things were so bad and the drug abuse, everything was so bad, I actually tried to commit suicide. And miraculously, um, I, I failed at it. And I woke up two days later and I know, I know that God was right there then. I know he was there and that's why, you know, I was still alive. Finally taking that step and walking through those doors that day, it, it changed everything. I have to thank God every single day for everything that he's blessed us with. I'm not a big fan of journaling. I have to force myself to do it. But for some reason, I journaled years ago, I mean, 10, 20 years ago, when I was at my worst. And I found those journals. And to go back and to read, you know, what I was struggling with, what I was looking for, and to fast forward now to where we are and see that God has answered so many prayers over the years, even before I really knew who he was, uh, we were just very blessed, very blessed. So I'm just, I'm so thankful for everything that we've gotten out of community. I feel like if God wasn't first in our lives, I don't think we'd be anywhere where we are right now. In the past year, so many things have changed in our lives. In a year and a half, we were baptized, we got engaged, we got married, um, we've helped out with Alpha courses, uh, we just bought our first house, and I just know without God being the center of focus for us, none of that would have ever happened. You know, and I, I remember we used to give. We'd show up and I'd throw, you know, five or ten dollars in the giving back to God. And, you know, now I'm doing it online. When we got married and I started doing all the bills and I showed her what we were giving, and her eyes kind of <laughs> got big. I said, yeah, because everything we have is from him. And I keep giving and he keeps giving back. So he's blessed us and it's our prayer that we can continue to bless others as well. Everything that we have is because of God. So I want to pour back into helping other people find their way back to God in any way, shape, form that I can. God, God is, is number one, one and, and we are one on this mission. mission. 
I love that story. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you what I, what I just absolutely, truly believe with all my heart. Um, two things. First, I think if you're here today, like Zacchaeus, it's because you want to see and know who Jesus is. I mean, you want to make him number one in your life, right? I mean, that's why we're all here, right? It's all right. It's no worries. But it's true. It's true. It's why we're all here and not wherever that person wants us to be, right? I mean, that's why I'm here. That's why I do what I do week after week. But here's the other thing I know. Like Jesus said to Zacchaeus, this is what he's saying to you and to me. He's saying, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. <laughs> and if we come down, come down from our trees, and if we invite Jesus into our house, he will become number one in our lives. And when he does, our finances, our relationships, our purposes will be transformed. Now, like many of you, for the past two, two weeks, I've been carrying around with me one of these commitment cards, and, and it's and for, for this purpose. In two weeks, February 28th, we're going to have an opportunity to come together, all 12 locations, as one church with one vision to accomplish this one mission together. And I really do mean this. The primary goal for this initiative is for every person, for every family to be involved. I mean, if, if someone just off the street walked in today, wrote a check to cover the expense for everything that we believe God is calling us to do as a church, we would not meet our primary goal. Our primary goal is for every single one of us, just like Zacchaeus, to make God number one in our lives through an expression of generosity. And, and not necessarily to give half back <laughs> or four times, but, but to give in a way that honors God and that, that makes him number one. So as you're considering that commitment, let me share with you a process that my wife and I are going through with this commitment. We've, we've been talking about it. Many of our staff are kind of going through the same thing. Um, step one for us is, is stretch. See, over the, over the past weeks, we've been talking, my wife and I, about our budget and about what it looks like to, to reallocate dollars from one category to the other to sort of make room to prepare uh, for this, for the margin that will be required for one. And it's really kind of a, a, a I don't know, a, a step that we can make kind of within our own, like kind of looking at the dollars and cents. Um, step two is sacrifice. See, because after that, then we went to our budget and we really started to take a look at some of the items, some of the things that we spend on and, and really just kind of act, asking ourselves, what does it look like to make a sacrifice in each area for two years? What does that look like? And let me just level with you, okay? So this is just as honest as I can be. One of the areas that I know I can sacrifice in is in this area called Starbucks, all right? So here's what I did. I prepared for this message, so I took a look at my budget, and the little computer thing has a way. I can just type in Starbucks, and then it'll tell me what I spent in Starbucks, because of course you have to have the card, and you have to have the app, and you, have, you get to order at home, and then you just pick it up, and you go, oh, that's so great. Oh, I can't believe I didn't have to talk to anybody or have community. It was so great. And, and then after a while, you get a free one, so that keeps you going, you know, the whole thing. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But I took a, I took a, I took a look at the spending just in that coffee shop. Forget, like, other, other restaurants or other drinks or whatever. Just at Starbucks, our family, and I say our family to implicate my wife as well, our family is spending, on average, about 46 bucks a month. And that, that's not very many coffee drinks, as it turns out. But, I mean, come on, 40, 46 bucks a month? I mean, if, if, if our family just decided to cut that in half and to just sacrifice half of that, and in addition to what we plan on giving with our tithes and our above and beyond offerings, if we sacrifice just half of that, I just double up the caffeine in one order so that we can kind of stretch it out, <laughs> Over two years, that's $600. That's a $600 commitment in addition. I mean, those things, those sacrifices are real. They could happen. It's worth taking a look 
at what categories you can sacrifice in. Some you can, some you can't. Um, probably for our family, that's one where we can. Uh, but then step three is spirit-led. And I'm still definitely in this step, so is my wife. Uh, I mean, we, we probably will be all the way until February 28th. And step three, really, is about taking a step of faith. Hearing from God. What would he have me give, even if right now I don't know where that would come from? That's pretty scary. <laughs> it takes faith. Um, but I want to be spirit-led. I want to stretch. I want to sacrifice. I want to be spirit-led in demonstrating financially my total devotion to Jesus. I want to be dependent on God to provide. So two weeks from today, we'll have that opportunity to come together as one church with one vision to accomplish one mission. And my prayer is that God will unite us as one on that day, one heart and one mind, so that together we will be able to move from me to we. And when we do that, we will be giving the opportunity to hundreds and potentially thousands of people, brand new, to find their way back to God. And that's worth it for me. I hope it is for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you're doing in our church. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for uh, stretching us. God, thank you for, um, for the examples that you've given of those who have come before us who have been transformed. And God, we ask that, that you give us specific opportunities to be able to, to demonstrate that transformation that we so desperately want. Uh, give us opportunities to be able to share this message with others. Uh, give us opportunities in our small groups to be able to talk through the, the difficult circumstances and, the, and the, the tough things that we're going through and the ways in which you're currently working. Because uh, God, we know that those things aren't happening in a vacuum. All of these things that, that are happening as we seek to serve you uh, are in community. They're happening together. So God, give us small groups. Give us uh, leaders who can reach us and, and give us opportunities uh, to be able to connect uh, and to, to intentionally make sacrifices that honor you uh, and that moves your mission forward. Uh, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, community. I want to take a moment to make sure that you have made plans to join us this Saturday, February 20th, for the One Initiative Advanced Commitment Night. The Advanced Commitment Night is going to be a very special time of prayer, celebration, as we go first to make our commitment saying, God, you are number one. Now, in case you're wondering what's with all the Bears gear here, and notice, vintage Gale Sayers. Well, we're going to be holding this event at Historic Soldier Field in Chicago this Saturday at 7 p.m. So join us at the First Floor United Club for a time of worship, celebration, some delicious desserts, and a whole lot of fun. In fact, there's a very cool special moment that I want to tell you about, but I can't. So you just got to be there. Don't miss this chance to experience what I think is going to be a pivotal and memorable night in the history of community. And we've done everything we can to eliminate anything that'll keep you from joining us this night. So when you RSVP, you'll get info on free parking, vouchers for your child care, clear, easy directions how to get there. I mean, seriously, there's no reason not to be there. It is going to be awesome. So right now, go to communitychristian.org one. Go there right now, and I'll see you and your friends at Soldier Field.